Now, w one thing which people who maybe don't know a great deal about art know about Titian is Titian and women and think of the Venus of Urbino, that very, very famous reclining nude. So what questions did you approach that area of Titian's output with? Well, I suppose the I suppose the key one it might seem slightly crass. I mean, it's just something that's occupied people, for critics and these art historians and romantics for centuries. Is here's this bloke, like anybody, else, any other man, locked up in a room, locked up in a you know, sort of stuck in a room, hours and days on end with a be beautiful naked young woman, surrounded by you know voluptuous floozies of every stamp. Did he know them, as they used yeah. to say? And I think for in the night, maybe maybe the night, if he went back 150 years, you take it assumed that Titian did what any man would do under those circumstances. Mm. Much more recently, but this has this has been looked at with a greater degree of skepticism. And I just, I just wanted to, to to look at that again, going back to my idea of the romantic artist. Yeah, the the artist and his mistress. After they've made love, she sprawled out on the bed. He paints her in the glow from the gas fire. They sick it or Toulouse-Lautrec. They paint paintings that are obviously relate to that idea. Mm. Getting back to Titian's time, as I said, it's a business. If there's a, a nude woman at all, she's lying in a, almost like a warehouse, industrial unit. Mm. I mean, it, it, that's the equivalent idea. You know, this is a business, people wandering in and out the whole time. So it's hardly very intimate. And actually, when you, when you start to analyze the image of the, the Venus of Urbino, the further, the further you get away from the idea of uh, just one man and a beautiful young woman, firstly, the, the, the painting, the, the body of the woman was initially taken from a painting by, by, by his sometime friend and rival who died 30 years before, George Oni. Mm. He just transposed that. And the head may have been taken from, from somebody else and sort of, you know, plonked on later. So these, these things are highly constructed. And I, really, every paint, almost every painting by Titian is as enigmatic and complex as that, has kind of issues of what the hell is going on. And I think that's what is so fascinating about an artist of that period. It's partly, partly the distance in time and the difference in culture mm. means you really, you really have to kind of readjust your focus in coming to these paintings. But also the paintings themselves are inherently complex. That they have this marvelous richness. When I remember was years ago, walking around the Prado in, in Madrid and just spending hours and hours and hours looking at these paintings. Over, and they're, they're like nineteenth, they call them nineteenth-century novels. Mm. You know, you can really just go into the painting and kind of live in it because there's the space. There's the kind of depth, the richness, the narrative, you know what I mean? The subtitle of the book is The Last Days. And yeah. what was it about those last days and those late paintings that made you want to sort of present the story from the perspective of, of, of Titian's final days? Titian in his last, in his, difficult to know quite when, but towards the end of his life, produced perhaps 10 or 12 paintings, which really do, certainly do appear to the modern eye to kind of take painting to somewhere it had never gone, gone at the time. They're much more raw in treatment. Mm. They, have a kind of, they have a kind of modern look in the sense that they're not kind of hugely finished off with glowing varnishes. Mm. They have a raw, provisional look. I'm thinking of the means like the Pietà in the Academia in Venice, Flying of Marcius, or the Death of Action in the National Gallery. Mm. And I mean, one of the things that exercises art historians now is, was it, had he gone into some great final, last, tragic phase, you know, rather like Beethoven did with his late string quartets? Yes. Or, or did he just simply leave behind a load of paintings he never got around to finishing mm. that have this kind of really, really raw look for that reason? That was one, that was one thing, but I, these paintings, I mean, if you want to look at an old master painting that doesn't look like an old master, that doesn't have that kind of sort of super gloss that you find, that looks quite modern, yes. those, are the, those are the ones I think you should, you should go for. And it was the enigmatic quality of these paintings. What did he think he was doing? That really got me, got me very curious. And there was also a story, possibly true, very, there certainly an element of truth in it, that at the time of his death, his studio was, was robbed, but mm. was looted just during the Great Plague epidemic of 1576, and a number of paintings taken. There was the idea that there might be more of these paintings that would kind of uh, fill in the missing pieces of the story. That I just kind of was a kind of um, 
a motif that drew me into the, drew me into the story. Mm. I mean, needless to say, trying to <laughs> find out the reality of all that, it's going to be exceptionally <laughs> difficult at this remove. Mm. But, but that, it was a kind of curiosity about that. And the, the, the motif of this old man in his, stu- in his studio producing these, these tragic enigmatic works. And when I went to the house, his, look at his house, which is, is not a museum or anything, it's just an ordinary house. And I was peering through the keyhole into the garden. All this started to kind of crystallize as a kind of the central image of the book.